Welcome fellow travellers, learners and explorers. I'm Georgia Ellis and thank you for tuning in to the Alice in Wonderland podcast. Today I'm joined by Rachel barbanel fried Rachel is a clinical psychologist and optimal performance consultant and she's based in Massachusetts. Rachel works with executive teams, individuals, couples and families and she helps them elevate performance, achieve growth and change and also helps them with their healing. She is also an advocate for food as medicine, and she recently became a consultant for the Flow Research Collective, and they're a collective that um, focus on peak performance and training. So let's get curious. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. Absolute pleasure. I'm glad that we've got you here because there's lots of things in your repertoire that I think we're going to be able to go dive down some rabbit holes. So we'll see where we end up today. I'm looking um, forward to it. Yeah, awesome. So there's a question that I ask all of my all of my guests, and I'd love to ask you this question as well. So I want you to imagine that I'm seven year old Alice uh, from Alice in Wonderland, and I'm skipping my way through Wonderland in this wonderful magical place, and I bump into you, and I say, Rachel, what what do you do? What's your purpose here on Earth? Why are you in Wonderland? How would you answer that to a seven-year-old girl? I love that question um, because I think that that's... So I think that how we communicate with kids is actually often sort of our most basic truth because kids can kind of see through all the, you know, BS. Um, And my answer is... I'm a feelings doctor and I work with people who are struggling to understand what is getting in their way. And usually we are getting in our own way. And that's, that, that's what I would say. Yeah. Awesome. I love that description of I'm a feelings doctor. So let's, let's unpack that. What, what led you to become a, a feelings doctor? Um, that's a really um, good question. Um, and it's sort of funny because I actually come from a family full of psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and my whole life I said, I wasn't going to do this. And oh, then, funny, hey? uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then I worked a lot with, um, I did a lot of youth work And I found out that I I realized that I liked working with all of the kids that nobody else liked working with, all the people that were like sent away or put on the side or were difficult or whatever. Um, And so I sort of had this realization, I'm going to be a psychologist and literally nobody in my life was surprised. (laughs) Everybody was like, we're glad you're finally like here and you've gotten to this point because we've just been waiting for you to get here. So, um, but I didn't actually think that I was going to do therapy. I thought I was going to run a camp um, for kids who were um, sort of having difficulty in, you know, their in school. Um, And that's a lot of the work that I did. Um, But my part of what I really love about my career is that I've been able to really shift and change depending on where my interests are. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about some of the, some of the shifts and changes and add-ons that you've had on, on your journey. So you started off wanting to help, help youth and um, we'll call them for want of a better term, the underdogs. And then your, your interests have, have been peaked and you've gone off on, you know, little tangents here and there. So what are some of the tangents you've been on and, and why? What, what led you to them? 
So I started working um, with um, adjudicated youth. So youth that was like in and out of, you know, the juvenile delinquent system, right? That was who I started working with. I worked for, with those folks um, in, uh, in my training. And then after I finished, after I got my degree, and one of the things that I realized was that these kids were get. I mean, these kids came from, everybody came from really, really tough backgrounds. And they were getting into bad situations because they were getting really heated. Like they were, you know, they were getting angry or overwhelmed or anxious or whatever it was. And then they couldn't think. And if you can't think, you can't get yourself out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And so I started actually working with these kids around mindfulness and meditation and breath control. And I worked, and then, you know, so I worked with them around the idea of like these, a lot of these kids thought they wanted to be, you know, pop stars, rap stars, sports stars. I said, well, if you're going to be good at basketball, you have to be able to control your breath. If you're going to be a singer, you have to be able to control your breath. Um, and so from there, I then went to like getting a yoga teacher training and getting training in mindfulness meditation. And the same thing happened with, um, you know, learning about how food affects us. And so I got, you know, trained to talk with people about nutrition and how that affects our mood and all of these things are really helpful whether I'm working with kids or adolescents or you know executives so it's like it's been just a great I don't know it's been a really fun journey for me yeah. sort of being able to follow yeah, there's, there's two things that really piqued my interest there when you were talking and one is around the breath the breath work that you were teaching with with the youth um so i want to talk about that and also the food as medicine but first i want to I want to hone in on the on the breath and the breathing so you did your yoga so what is it about what is it about breath work and why do you why do you find that's really important to be teaching not just youth but anyone what is it what does the breath do um well if we don't breathe we're dead right <laughs> so yeah, um but I mean, and, and, I, and I say that to people because um, the breath is our connection that carries the oxygen from the air to our brains. And if you are not breathing correctly, you are not oxygenating your brain. And if your brain doesn't have adequate oxygen, then it doesn't work so what happens is in a um, fight or flight response, right? So um, you you we're, we're all biological animals, right? So we're being chased by a tiger, and we have an automatic response, and our bodies either freeze, or they flee, or they we're we're tuned up to to fight. But there are certain things that happen in that in that moment, and one of the things that happens is our respiration gets really fast mm -hmm. and it gets really shallow because we're getting ready to like get amped up, which is great if you want to actually fight the tiger or run really fast, but it's not great if the thing that you're um, kind of struggling with is the fact that the bus is late or um, you have a lot of papers that need to be dealt with. And the biological response is the same. Our bodies don't know the difference between, you know, tax season and like a real um, you know, you know, tiger or some other kind of danger. And so when we learn how to control the breath, then you can actually learn how to can keep yourself at a much calmer um, stage state so that you can respond and not react. Yeah. Beautiful. And yeah, I, I love what you're saying there because, um, we are very much wired uh, through and through through time to, yeah, to protect ourselves, and we protect ourselves through that fight, flight, or freeze. And in this modern day, you're right; it's not a tiger anymore that's our threat. It's the the mother-in-law, the father, the boss, the colleague, the missing the bus, uh, taxes that are due. Uh, you know, anything, not having money to buy your groceries, all these things really trigger the same response within our body, don't they? So I, 
I'll, I'll share this story with you that I have a, I have three kids and I have a 10 year old and he, um, it was just Halloween here and there's, you know, it's basically just a ton of candy, right? So the candy, um, we put it away and they have, you know, they can take a certain amount every day. The other day I caught him with his hand in the candy jar and he saw me and I saw him and he froze. I saw, and I thought, and then he froze and he looked at me and then he just took off. (laughs) I don't know where he thought he was going. Right. But I thought, Oh, that's a great example of the fight flight or, or flee. Right. And then he came back and he sort of tried to explain himself, you know, so there's the like fighting. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's inbred. You, if you think you're in trouble, if you think you're in danger, you don't have a choice about how you respond. It's, it's automatic. Mm. Yeah. And it's funny how just the simple things like getting caught with our hand in the candy bowl can trigger those things. And then back to the breath. So the automatic response is that shallow breathing, which then shuts down oxygen to the brain, but also starts, we start to send energy to the legs so that we can get the hell out of there. So the breathing, as you're explaining it, is our ability to bring ourselves back to homeostasis, which is that bring us back to that karma, karma nature so that we have the ability to think. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and, you know, it actually, there's a whole cascade of things that happens when we're in that, in that, when we're having that kind of response. So our, um, our eyes dilate, um, our breathing gets really shallow, our thinking goes offline, you're just responding to like instinct and actually your digestion shuts down. Mm. And I think that's fascinating because a lot of people, um, so especially some of our listeners who work in corporate environments, they, they end up with all these health problems and they're not quite sure why. And it's because they're constantly in this taxing stress mode. And mm-hmm. so if, if that's happening, you know, where eyes are dilating, so therefore we're really, that increases our focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means we're very shut down to being open to other things. Mm -hmm. Um, so therefore we can't actually see a solution. And then also our digestive system is shutting down. If we continually are in this stressed mode, imagine this, the actual ramifications on your body and on your life, if you don't stop and get yourself out of that. Right. And we don't have to imagine it. We have a lot of research to, um, back that up. Yes. Um, and, um, there's, uh, so just talking about the stress response, so there's a, the Henry Benson Institute, which is here um, in um, Boston, and it's part, I think it's affiliated with Harvard, um, and they years ago showed with, you know, medical, like this is like hardcore medical science research that they can re- reverse heart disease, reverse heart disease with 20 minutes of meditation a day. Mm, That does not surprise me. It was shocking at the time that this Mm. research was done, right? Now we have a lot more evidence and we know about these things, but for a lot of people, I mean, this is, I think, still really kind of out there. When I talk to people and I tell them, you know, you can come and see me um, and I'm happy to talk to you, but, you know, bang for buck, the best thing you can do for yourself is meditate. Absolutely. So yeah, you, yeah. you mentioned earlier that you went off on that tangent of, you know, yoga and med- mindfulness meditation. Uh, mm-hmm. So talk to us a little bit more around some of the other benefits around this breath and meditation, because, you know, we've talked about breath, but meditation as well is something that we know there's so much, there are so many scientific research papers. There's thousands mm-hmm. of them that can show you the benefits of meditation. So what have you been finding with your clients when they adopt these things? What are some of the things that are changing for them? Um, so what, what I say to adults, right? Not kids. I tried to give this to you a little bit in your, in the response to the seven-year-old you. Um, but my, I see my job as helping people get out of their own way. Yeah. We all have patterns that we do, you know, consciously or unconsciously that are ingrained for lots of really good reasons, but don't work for us. They worked for us for a period of time and they don't work for us anymore. And mindfulness 
really helps us to understand where is it that it's breaking down and what are the parts that I'm going to be able to um, take with me because they're, uh, they're useful and what are the parts that I just need to leave behind. So for instance, um, a lot of people that I work with are really self-critical. Mm -hmm. They don't even realize that they're self-critical. The first um, extended... I went to a, um, so I did a training a long time ago with um, John Kabat-Zinn, who is like, you know, a mindfulness guru. He's a amazing teacher and wonderful person. And I, we had to sit in silence for, I don't remember, two or three days. And I, I realized, and I'd already been in therapy for a long time and I had, you know, been working on myself and I had been a therapist and all these things. And I realized that there's this ticker tape of thinking that happens underneath Whatever, it else, whatever else is going on. So, you know, you and I are having a conversation, but underneath there's this ticker tape, uh, you know, of what's, what else I'm saying to myself. And I realized at that, in, in that situation, that my ticker tape was really some kind of, you know, re repetition of, I suck, I'm terrible, I'm not good enough. And it was the first realization that I had, oh my God, that if I'm telling myself this constantly, how am I going to actually believe anything else? You won't. <laughs> right. Mm. And, and, and self-criticism is a, is a very tricky thing because for most of us, you need a certain amount of self-criticism in order to better yourself, right? If you think, ah, eh, this is good enough, you're not going to like, you're not going to work to get any better. So you do need a little bit of self-critique and you need a little bit of like awareness of what didn't work well. But most of us tune that like up to, you know, some really high percentage that like then it's just the thing that's getting in our way and it's, in, it's not actually enabling us to get better. Yeah. And look, I, with my own clients, I see the same thing. That's one of the biggest when the biggest blocks for most people is the stories that they tell themselves below the surface. And right. um, yeah, and we can actually, we can actually see what it is that they're telling themselves without them actually verbalizing it because the results in their life are a, are a mirror reflection of what they've been telling themselves. And right. a lot of the time they don't realize it because it is that it's there. It's not only, it's only the time in the mindfulness and the silence that you actually hear it and go, Oh wow. I've been saying that to myself. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, and it's, you know, it's a really useful skill because it's also something that you can use um, and nobody has to be aware of it, mm. right? So I work with lots of families and I work with lots of parents and like, you know, I have people meditating in their cars at pickup time, right? So nobody else needs to know that, right? And then there are people who I, I work with a lot of really high... Um, high powered folks who have like a lot riding on their, you know, success at work and um, bringing some mindfulness to their commute changes how the rest of their day goes. For folks who um, have, you know, jobs and families, being able to be aware of what you're bringing from one place to another makes a huge difference in how you then arrive in that place. Mm. Absolutely. And you're talking there about that, that self-awareness piece and of the, the term, which is in neuroscience term of metacognition, which is basically you can, as a individual, you can actually notice what you're bringing to, from work to home, you can actually mm -hmm. notice your thoughts, but in the same instance, this is our superpower, we yeah. have the ability to change those thoughts. It's the one thing we can change. Yeah. So, or, you know, have. So I, I don't, I don't know if we can always change the thoughts, but we can change the reaction that mm -hmm. we have to the thought. And that's what I love about the, cause it's, cause metacognition is the idea of understanding how we think. Right. So it took me a very long time to get away from that idea of I suck. Mm right? But I didn't have to believe it. And I didn't have to interact with it in the same way. So what did you do? So how did you overcome the, uh, the, the ticker take of I suck? 
um, a lot of sitting with it and talking back to myself mm -hmm. and being much more honest about it and, you know, um, sort of like that, that dance of sort of being aware of the thought, but not giving the thought itself a whole lot of power just because yeah. you think it doesn't mean it's true. Mm. That's gold, isn't it? Cause a lot of people think stuff and they believe that what they're thinking and you have a choice of what you believe. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And that's really powerful for our listeners to understand that, that you can notice your thoughts and you can let them pass on by like a cloud mm -hmm. and just let them pass by. Or you can notice your thoughts and buy into them and think that, that that's true in your reality. And that can sometimes, if the, if the thoughts are things like, I suck, well, that sort of sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's some really good pieces of gold there. So it's really nice to see that. Uh, so with your clients, you're showing, you're giving them ways to be able to become more mindful, notice those things and set themselves up for, for success and having more calmness just purely with, you know, meditation at the pickup, meditation on the commute or, you know, whatever it is, you're becoming more aware and more mindful of your life. And that's mm -hmm. where you have the point of power, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really powerful pe that I'm trying to give people the power to, you know, make their lives better. Yeah. And what have you, now I know you won't be able to talk about specifics and, and names or anything, but what have you noticed with, you know, some of the clients you've had that have adopted this, they've put it into practice. What are some of the shifts that they've noticed in their, in their life or you've noticed as their clients? What are the, some of the differences this this small amount of meditation is making in their life. What are the results from doing that? I mean, the results can be, you know, can be anything from better communication with um, a spouse or a partner to um, doing better at work to not getting into altercations. You know, um, Boston, I don't know if you know, is really well known in the States for having super aggressive driving. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So there's like super, super aggressive driving here. And um, it's, it's a real stressor for people because people drive on their commutes and it's, you know, it's fast and, and people are, and to be able to have a moment of pause and realize that just because you got cut off by somebody doesn't mean you have to react in that way, can change the way you feel in that moment. And then that has a cascading effect you know, for how you arrive to your destination. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the difference because you mentioned reacting. So talk to me about your interpretation of the difference between say reacting and responding. So they're very closely aligned, but yeah. they are different. And I think you're giving people a, a, a tool to be able to do something different instead of reacting. Right. So, so that's a great question because, um, when I'm talking, I'm talking about it in a very specific way, and I'm not talking about it in sort of the like scientific um, research way. Um, when you talk about doing, uh, when you talk about a response, that's an automatic response in the in the research literature about behavior. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually making a distinction between a reaction being the automatic response. You know, we don't have time to think about it. It's just somebody throws a ball at you, you catch it, right? Um, and the response being the slower, more methodical, more thoughtful way that you respond, right? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you have time to figure out what's the way you want to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Beautiful. Because we go through our life so, so often reacting to everything, all the stimulus from the external world and we react because that's the automatic program way that we are, the emotional reactions that we've had over time that either serve us or don't serve us. 100%. So your, this mindfulness piece you're talking about gives you the ability to respond and slow it down and actually change, change the, what you're doing in that moment. And that has a significant difference because you're right. You know, you turn up to your destination. We'll use road rage or as an example, you turn up to your destination a lot different than if you had reacted automatically negatively to someone cutting you off in traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, is that once you become aware of the power of the breath, there's different ways to use the breath. 
So mm -hmm. you can use breath. Most often we talk about using breath as a down regulating tool. So people get you know, anxious or angry or worked up. And we talk about coming back to the breath, evening it out, concentrating on your exhalation. And that brings us down to a calmer place. But also breath work can be used for an upregulation. So um, I worked with someone a long time ago um, who had a real, who was very, very, very depressed and had a very, very difficult job situation. And we worked a lot with her paying attention to what her breath was feeling like in her body. And then she could go into the bathroom multiple times a day and either use some breath exercises to upregulate herself, right? To energize, to get herself more able to think, um, more able to respond in a, in a meaningful way. Or if she was feeling up, if she's feeling too anxious, too, you know, revved up, then she could use the breath work to help downregulate herself so that she could respond in a more thoughtful way. Such an amazing tool. So for our listeners, what's an example or a way that, so what's a technique for upregulating and what would be the technique that they could practice for downregulating? So when you inhale, that is bringing the oxygen into your into your lungs and and then you know the carried through your blood through to your to your brain every time you inhale that is an an up regulation and if you want to be more energized right if you think about people right who are in that fight or flight or who are somebody if if anybody if you've ever hyperventilated right it's like <gasps> so any of these short quick concentrating on inhaling that's going to up regulate you um, and to downregulate, you really have to just concentrate on the exhalation. So what I tell people do to do for a downregulation is to count the breath. So it can be whatever count feels comfortable. One, two, three, you can count to eight, doesn't matter. But the exhalation needs to be longer than the inhalation. Okay. And as long as your exhaling is long, is longer than your inhaling, that's going to automatically calm you. Mm -hmm. So just to reiterate, so to upregulate, so to get more energy and potentially be able to get a little bit more creative, maybe we would be doing short, sharp inhalations. Correct. Very fast, you know, nose yeah. or mouth or both, right. or it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. They're different. Yeah. They're, you know, there's a million different ways you can, you know, YouTube yeah. it and like, different, you know, different traditions, yeah. whether it's yoga or Buddhist or whatever, different traditions have different ways to, to do it, but it's all basically inhaling or exhaling. Cause yeah. those are the two main parts of the breath. So up, up regulation, more energy, more focus on what you're taking in and probably sh longer e inhales and exhales. So you'd be exhaling quite fast you as can, well. You can do that or you can just inhale quickly. Yeah. So it really depends. There are you know, different ways. To, there's a million different ways to do it. And everybody finds their own way that works for them. Their own um, rhythm. Yeah. Be yeah. Beautiful. And then so to downregulate and to become more calm, the main focus is if you're exhaling, just make your exhaling longer than your inhale. So you could That's be exciting. inhaling for the count of two, but exhale for the count of four, or you could be inhaling Absolutely. for the count of four, exhale for the count of six or eight or 10 or something. Right. So that's, yeah. that's to me, the most simple way of thinking about yeah. it, right? Sure. You can get much more detailed and complicated and there are lots of different ways that you can work with it. But to me, in terms of like, cause you know, usually when you're overwhelmed and anxious and in that fight or flight space, you can't think. So you just need to figure out how to calm yourself. And if you can just remember, okay, I just need to concentrate on my exhale. Yeah. That's going to help you get there. What a wonderful gift and beautiful tool for people. And just keep it simple. And if people want to know more and go deeper, just, you know, there's lots of information on this on somewhere like That's Google, right. <laughs> YouTube, exactly. yeah. but what a great, just easy, simple way to help people upregulate, downregulate. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's so mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Sure. How about, this is getting some value out of you today, Rachel. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, 
that's what we're about. So I want to flip back to the other thing that we were talking about uh, that you mentioned, one of the other sort of avenues that you went off on. So there was the breath and the mindfulness, which we've covered off, which is fantastic. And then you also mentioned uh, food as, I'm going to say food as medicine or just how food affects us. So what, how did you get into that? What was it that made you make that journey and start going down that path as well? Well, so first of all, I've just always been interested in food. I've always loved cooking and loved food. So I've just been really interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually starting, um, I started to have an awareness, which came from, I think, um, my yoga training in large part, that what we put in our bodies really affects us. So I went to India and I studied um, with a bunch of people there and um, they, you know, talk about Ayurveda and Ayurveda is so much about really paying attention to what your body needs in a particular season or at a particular time. And then later on in my, you know, sort of in my trajectory, it became increasingly clear that the brain is actually, the, I'm sorry, the, our stomach, our gut is actually our second brain. And what I mean by that is that all of the neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that our body um, uh, creates and uses to, to um, work anything that, you know, how we feel, anything that is, you know, operating in our body, it's all actually made in our guts. So that to me was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. because when people come to me and they're talking about how they're feeling, it has to do with neurotransmitters. And if you start, when I start to think about it, um, all of the feelings, like a lot of our feeling words have to do with like, we have butterflies in our stomach or we're sick to our stomach or our, sum, our stomach is tied up in knots. And it turns out that the science actually shows that that's true, that, that our guts, our whole internal digestive system actually really has a tremendous effect on how we feel. And, you know, I think the thing that we do most often intentionally is eat, right? The stuff that we put on the end of our forks has a tremendous amount of power, but most of us spend a lot of time really unconscious about what it is that we're putting in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so I did, you know, some more training around that and it's become another tool that again, you know, I'm trying to help people. I, I tell people when they come, my, my goal is like to work myself out of a job, right? My goal is to give you the tools that you need to then go out and not need to come back. Right. And, um, if you are aware that the food that you eat is going to affect the way that you feel and perform, then that's a, an amazing tool to be able to utilize. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you incorporate that with the people you work with and how do you incorporate it into your own life? So what are some of the things around this food is medicine? Because there's, there's a couple of tangents we could go on. There's, you know, there's superfood. You should be Still eating matter. this and there's, yeah, there's so many with food, right? But, um, I'm also aware that we're all very unique and we all are very complex, unique beings. And you could sit here and say, hey, you know, you've got to have um, caffeine's a superfood. You have caffeine in the morning, blah, blah. And I'm going to sit here and go, I'm sorry, I can't have caffeine. I'm super sensitive to it. Um, so therefore, how do you work with your clients around food? Because it's not, you're not giving them nutritional advice or diet diet. Right. I'm not. I am not a new. I am not Let's a. Let's be really clear advice. here that that's not what it's about. Yeah. Okay. Give nutritional advice at all, um, but just like you know, you know, when you get a pill, right? If you get medicine from the doctor, they have to know how old you are, and how much you weigh, to know what is the appropriate amount, mm -hmm. right? So it's individualized, and that is also true with food. So we're seeing, you know, there's tons of research and, and evidence that like people who have different genetic backgrounds need to eat differently. Um, so it's not up to me to tell you what you should eat. 
Um, I do think that if you kind of, there are two things that I keep in mind. One is Michael Pollan's, um, you know, he has the three sentences, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Mm. And the other thing that I try to keep in mind is Winston Churchill, who said, um, everything in moderation, including moderation. Yeah. Right. So food is supposed to be about community. Food is supposed to be about nourishment, but most of us actually aren't nourishing ourselves, right? We eat in the car, we eat while we're on our phones, we eat in meetings. Um, and it's, again, it's, a, you know, you ha it takes 20 minutes for your body to communicate, for your guts to communicate with your brain to know that you're full. So if you're um, eating mindlessly, you're going to eat way more than you intended, which is not going to leave you feeling very good. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't eat food that has nutritional content, right. So if you're only eating stuff that is, um, you know, sugary and sort of gives you a dopamine hit, right. Makes you feel happy, but it doesn't actually nourish you. You're also in the long run, you're not going to feel very good. Yeah. And so I do a really, um, like, you know, a really detailed discussion with people about what they eat, how they feel when they eat, how often do they eat with other people, how thoughtful are they about what they're eating, um, how much cooking do they do. Um, the vast majority of people in the United States, and I'm guessing that it's not that different in Australia, um, who are not living sort of an indigenous lifestyle, don't cook the majority of their meals. Mm. Yeah, so they don't really know what's going in if you're not cooking it yourself, right? Right. So there's a couple of things you said there that I think we can go off on a couple of tangents with. One was when you eat something, how does it make you feel? So why is that important for our listeners to understand how food is making them feel? Um, well, because I think we often, we eat for lots of different reasons. We eat because it's social. We eat because, um, our mother wants us to eat a particular thing. We eat because we don't, we learn not to waste food, but we don't often actually pay attention to how I feel when I eat this. And that feeling can be a lot of different kinds of things. It can be an emotional feeling, right? So um, most people have, when they feel sick, have a, have a particular thing that they crave, right? So it's something that gives them some sort of emotional sustenance, right? But um, if you don't pay attention to how it actually physically makes you feel, you might be missing the fact that it's not working for you. Yeah. So I have... Um, Another client that I worked with for a while who was convinced that she was lact the you know lactose intolerant that she couldn't have dairy and it was only after a lot of paying attention that she actually realized it was gluten and not dairy so she sort of had this one idea in her head about what was not making her feel good but it turned out to not be that yeah right so paying attention and again because you know I work with people so that they feel empowered to do whatever it is that they need to do to be their best self. I, I can't tell you because what works for me isn't going to work for you. My I whole life. I think that's gold because of so, so many people um, that we see, they, they shout from the rooftop something that's worked for them and they make, they actually make money on it and without well, realizing that everyone is, is individual and we really need to um, experiment with our own lives. And as you're saying there, pay attention, uh, pay attention, especially to the food. So personal example for me is, you know, I now will eat consciously. I'm at an age now where I've been eating for a very long time and I'm starting to understand because I started paying attention to if I eat cereal for breakfast, within an hour, I'm tired and have brain fog. Yep. So I don't eat cereal for breakfast. In fact, if I eat anything before 10 a.m., I have brain fog. 
So I don't have breakfast. Now, somebody yeah. else I was talking to the other day said, I do not function if I don't eat in the morning. Completely different. Mm -hmm. So right. we've really got to experiment with our, with our own unique physiology. And, but what you're saying is the most, is the key, is the pivotal key here is pay attention to how you feel. And that's the, I think that's such a great example because, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day has been drilled into us for decades. And it turns out that that is just not true for everybody. Mm -hmm. I am like you, I, you know, forced down oatmeal for decades. And then I found not only was I, you know, lethargic and like sluggish and couldn't think I was hungry two hours later. So it's like, well, what's happening here? But it was only you know, after doing a lot of this research that I really found, oh, realized, okay, so I also like, I'm not really naturally hungry until much later in the day. Mm. I do need my coffee. So I do have coffee. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm not really hungry until like noon. Yeah. Yeah, same. And I, I don't get hungry until a, a certain time in the day. I can go right through the day and actually really perform really well until I have my first meal, which is roughly... 10, 11 ish, sometimes even 12. Um, but everyone, my partner is different. He has to, he's up and he has to eat. Mm -hmm. Like he, seriously, right. he gets grumpy if he doesn't eat. Uh, I hope he doesn't listen to this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he has to eat. Whereas it's completely different, absolutely completely different. I can sustain it. But also I think for our listeners is to pay attention to what you are putting in, in your body and just see what it's doing to you physically afterwards. So there's certain foods I eat that make me have an itchy nose, um, but only realizing that, you know, I've realized it now for about 10 years, but later in my life. So food is really important, but it also, I think too, for you working with your clients, it impacts your moods. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So let's take sugar, for example. So we have these um, neurotransmitters that really are responsible for how we feel. Um, dopamine, serotonin are two of them. And um, when you eat something that is sugary, you get a hit. So our brain, if you look at brain scans of people who are on cocaine and people who have eaten sugar, they are identical. Mm. So look, can I just re ask and clarify something here? When you're talking sugar, are you talking refined sugar? Or are you talking natural sugars about, like apples have about, natural sugars? Or I'm talking, I'm talking pr primarily about um, refined sugars, added sugars. Um, uh, fruit has a natural occurring sugar in it, but it is modified in the way that it's digested because of the fiber that's attached to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm talking primarily around, um, you know, uh, like sugar or honey or whatever this added sweetener is. Yeah. Um, and so it sort of gives us this like great feeling. We feel up and then after a while we crash and we feel depressed or anxious or tired or whatever, and we crave more of it. And so in order to feed that beast, we have to have more. And so there's this real, you know, sort of jaggedy response that people have if they eat. And again, you know, so this is also true that like, this is also individualized. So, you know, my response is going to be different than your response and everybody has their own um, way of, you know, sort of metabolizing this and really understanding this. But in general, like that's what happens when we eat refined sugar. Yeah. And so there's so many things for us as, you know, as individuals to take responsibility for here. So first yep. of all, you know, we've been talking about breath and so forth, but being really mindful of what's going in your mouth and understanding how that's having an effect on you and really paying, being mindful about how that's playing out in your body. Is it making, is it giving you energy? Is it giving you lasting energy? Is it, making you grumpy? Is it making you short tempered? So really pay attention to what you're putting in and then what's happening afterwards. Because, and I love what you're saying here that what, how sugar affects you and how sugar affects me is going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. It'll have similar effects, but the, the time frame may be different. Right. My husband can eat one piece of chocolate. 
I cannot do that. I look at him like he is insane. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm just getting started, right? <laughs> you can eat one piece of chocolate, one bite of a cookie and be fine. That is not true for me. Yeah. Yeah. And this, yeah. And, but also like if you're having more than one piece of chocolate, is it having the same effect? So you might have, you might have one piece and you might finish the rest of the block, but you may have, exactly the same effects from that one piece in the whole block well it depends on what your effect is that you're yeah. looking for right and again you know i'm not i'm not vilifying anything right so chocolate is actually really good for us for lots of reasons um but um you know most of us don't think about why we are eating a particular piece of chocolate at a particular time mm. We just do it unconsciously. We do it because it's in the office or somebody offered it to us or because our kid's candy is sitting right there, you know, um, and, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, we're not usually thinking about what really is going to nourish me right now. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I think one of the biggest takeaways for people listening is to really start to pay attention to what you're eating and the, and the absolute effects. I know um, over the years I've noticed that um, there's certain foods for myself that, yep, just do not agree with me. And, but here's the thing. I doesn't mean I don't eat them. I know right. consciously when I'm going to eat them, the effects they'll have on me. Right. So you can make a choice. I'm, I'm making a conscious choice now. So That's for right. instance, I know that if I, I've actually stopped eating meat, but that was only a recent decision. But because when I ate meat, I was extremely lethargic for not only a few hours afterwards, but for days afterwards. And my digestive system really slowed down and I felt horrible. I couldn't wake up in the morning and my breath stank like I had, had a dead animal inside me, which I did. Right. So, um, yeah, so for me personally, that is my personal noticing that, um, I started to cut down a lot of it. But if I was going out before I stopped eating meat, I would still order meat, but I'd know well, I've got something really important to do tomorrow. So do I want to wake up lethargic? And I would actually make a conscious choice what I was eating when I went out. Mm -hmm. If I knew I didn't have to turn up and be switched on, I'd probably mm -hmm. order the meat. Right. But if I knew the next day I had something important to do, I'd go vegetarian option. So right. that comes with the awareness. And I th is that what you're talking about around helping that's people pay more attention and that's why you went down that path? Absolutely. So I have the sort of opposite actual story that I was a vegetarian for 15 years and I was a vegan for two years. I never as a kid ever really liked meat, wasn't into it even today, if I think about it too much, I get kind of grossed out if I think about what I'm eating. Um, but when I turned 30, I noticed that I was starting to bruise a lot, which I had never had that issue before. And I was actually craving meat, which was completely bizarre because that had never been something that I had noticed. So now I do eat meat occasionally. I eat mostly, you know, pretty vegetable forward. Um, but, you know, my body does need some meat. Yeah, and that's fair. And that, here's the thing. You understood that and you've listened to your body right. and you've made those choices. And I think that's brilliant. And that's what we need to do. And without, I think there also comes a, a point of doing it without, judgment not judging ourselves but also not judging others for their food choices especially if they're making conscious food choices as well right the two things that i do try to tell people to keep in mind that i think have been very helpful for me is i think that for i think really for all of us 75 percent of your plate should be vegetables mm. and that's not the way that we you know, you go to a restaurant, right? You get like a huge hunk of meat and like a tiny little circle of potatoes, right? So vegetables are really what have like the most um, phytonutrients, which are the, the, the chemicals that really switch us on or off. So if you sort of try to be vegetable forward, as I said, and think about eating the rainbow, I think you can kind of 
go, really go from your gut there yeah. because each different, um, each different vegetable color group has a different like a uh, message for our bodies that it's going to help us in different ways. And if you kind of, keep, I think for me, that's been such a, like a visual, simple way to kind of think about how to organize my eating. Yeah. So eat the rainbow. Eat the rainbow. <laughs> and if you need to eat the unicorn at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> or the pot of gold, I guess. Or the pot of gold, as long as it's those chocolate gold, <laughs> chocolate gold coated in, the chocolate's covered in gold, that's the thing. So talk to me about, I want to I wanna go back to you and your journey. So, you know, you've been on this amazing journey. You've decided that you wanted to, you know, help disadvantaged youth. You've gone off and realized that there's a, there's a place for mindfulness. There's a place for breath work. There's a place for what we put into our body. You know, what's been your, what do you think has been your greatest lesson along this journey so far? Because I'm sure there's more to come, but what do you think is one of the greatest lessons you've had through everything you've um, sort of pulled together? The greatest lesson. Huh, that's a great question. Um, the thing that I really think about often, and, and I think it's actually, while it's one of the hardest parts of my job, it's also one of the greatest privileges of my job, is that we all struggle. That all... It, to be human is to have, you know, difficult life. Like there's just no one is exempt from that. And so that's been really the thing that I think has, I, I, you know, I saw it with the disadvantaged youth and I see it with my super high powered, really successful, you know, venture capitalist guys. And I see it with the families that I work with and I see it in my family and I see it in myself that like, we all struggle and that is part of being human mm. and you can't escape it. Yeah. I love that. You can't escape it, but you can start to find ways to move through it. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. So what's, what's sort of your main focus now? What are you working towards now and, and why? What's, what's taking, what's piquing your interest? Uh, what is it, you know, any projects or anything like that that you've got on at the moment? Um, I mean, my sort of newest endeavor is this working with um, executives around um, really training them themselves into high performance. So, you know, the, the, using the concept of flow and really trying to get people to be their best selves, you know? Um, and I came to this again because, you know, of who I am and how, you know, my age and where I'm located, my office is located. Um, I was seeing these people who were like, you know, heads of hospitals or partners in law firms or, you know, business, you know, there's a lot of biotech here in Boston. So a lot of biotech people, um, and you know, everything looked great externally, but they were still suffering. Yeah. Right. So and so trying, yeah. yeah. So trying to figure out how to help them, you know, create a little bit more in, internal peace. That's kind of what I'm working on. Yeah. And it's awesome because just talking to you now, you have these amazing tools that you've been able to, you know, you've done deep dives in both in a couple of, not just the two areas we're focused on, but a number of areas that would really help, you know, people at that level that, yeah. And you're right. There's a lot of them. And even sometimes we put on this wonderful facade where we look like we've got it all together. Uh, and you're right. We all struggle. I love that. That's your greatest lesson. We all have elements of struggle. That's right. We all yeah. struggle. But yeah. there's tools and ways out there that can help us, you know, sail through that with a little bit more ease than we, than we, um, we need to have, you know, we don't need to have as much struggle. I'm not saying it's going to go away, but yeah, what amazing, what amazing gift you have and knowledge you have to be able to give people. I think that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So if we were to give our listeners or you, not me, if you were to give our listeners something you know some piece of advice for moving forward based on what you know um what would you like to leave our listeners with i think um 
I think that one of the most useful tools is curiosity. So when I'm working with people, I'm always trying to help them be curious about what's the, what's the reason they're doing that or feeling or they're thinking. Because when we um, find something that works, we often kind of box ourselves in to, you know, this has worked this many times, it's going to work this many times in the future. And that's not always true. So if we can stay curious about what's working, what's not working, um, where do I need to shift? You know, I think that that's a really useful tool that you can carry into whatever it is that piques your interest. That's brilliant. That, that helps growth. That helps progress. Um, that's an amazing tip and an amazing piece of advice. And I love it because, you know, this whole podcast is about being curious. So <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful piece of advice. Thank you so much. Now, if people need to get a hold of you um, or would like to work with you or pick your brains on something or learn more about the Flow Research Collective, um, how, what's the best way they can, they can get a hold of you? Um, my website is probably the best way. It's Dr. RBF. So my initials, um, it's doctor. And I actually, you can put in either doctor spelled out or drrbf.com. Either of those will get you to my website and I have a blog there and I'm on Instagram and Facebook, but that's probably the you know, best way to kind of reach me. Yeah. And I highly recommend people do reach out to you because you've got such a broad spectrum of experience there that you can offer people with your, you know, your, your psychology, the work you're doing with flow, the work you've done with mindfulness and yoga. You've also gone down the, you know, the food uh, side of things. So it's a real holistic approach to, to life and to helping people out. So I highly recommend people get in touch, read some of your blogs, follow, follow Rachel on, on Instagram or Facebook or wherever it might be. And yeah, get a load down to some of the great things she does. I know I'm following her on Instagram at the moment and she puts some great content out. So as a minimum, jump on board and follow her on Instagram. So thank, thank you. you so much, Rachel. It's been an absolute thank delight you. and so much wisdom and so many little tips and tools in there. Just in, you know, just in one episode, we've covered breath work, we've covered eating, we've covered mindfulness, you know, you name it, you know, you've got the load there. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And this has been such a delight to have a conversation with you. You are, I think, just brilliant and fascinating. And so it's been really a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Today is turning into the most curious adventure I've ever had.